Okay, well, I think we can go and then people will continue joining. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming to the session. Uh, we are very excited about it. Um, and I want, I'm, going, I'm going to introduce myself uh, and also Caroline Till. Um, I'm Javier Gras, and I will be hosting with Caroline uh, this session today. To give a little frame of myself, uh, I'm working for the Bioleadership Project as the relationships and impact lead uh, helping the movement grow um, and to increase our impact in the world. And Caroline, welcome to, please, if you want to present yourself, it would be great to hear from you. Hi, thanks, Javi. I'm, I'm Caroline. I'm, um, I guess, an ex-bioleadership fellow. I did the bioleadership fellowship um, a couple of years ago now, I think the first um, the first fellowship. I'm, um, I run a studio called Franklin Till. Uh, we're a design and research agency, and we support um, large brands and organizations to help to shift towards a more sustainable future. I know that word sustainable is, is you know, a bit of a catch-all, but um, we specialize in design and material innovation. And I guess my passion is um, climate, community, and creativity. Um, and I also have had a background in education. So I ran a master's at Central St. Martins. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, yeah, we just wanted to bring together a session that was combining the ambitions of the of the bioleadership fellowship, uh, the, the bioleadership project, sorry, as a whole, and really explore the role of, of creativity and particularly from, I guess, a sense of of joy coming from a really positive perspective in you know what is a, a difficult era um filled with anxiety um and how sort of creativity can enable a sense of proactivity and activism within that and yeah I've had the pleasure of um being really inspired by the work of the uh climate emergency network with and so thrilled to have abby and uh, kate with us today so yeah thank you so much for their time and we'll be passing on to them later thank you caroline thank you so much yeah you're already introducing the session that's very good thank you uh but just to start uh we normally in in the biology project we want to to arrive to the space with a short meditation to help everyone uh, land. Uh, I'm sure you all are very busy in your different laptops and, and days. Um, so if you want, you can turn your camera off or you can leave it as it is. Uh, and I would like to, to help you guys and go through a short meditation. Um, if you want, you can close your eyes and take a seat comfortable. And you can start breathing and feeling the breath going in and the breath going out. Breathing in and breathing out. Checking how the body is feeling. Feeling your feet on the ground. Letting the air come in and come out. And wondering how are you feeling now? How are you, body? How is your feet that holds all our weight? We can check with them and check how are our knees. How are the legs that supports our walking? How are our belly? Is it full? Is it empty? Does it have stress or is calm? How are our lungs that is letting all the air come in? And it goes out. Our head, our face, we allow it to relax. 
and let all the stress go out. And we allow to breathe two more times. And little by little, maybe we can start moving our fingers, our arms, our head. Maybe open our eyes. And feel hopefully more ready for the next hour that we have ahead. and more landed in our bodies. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, well, I hope, I hope it was useful and I hope it helps taking away all, uh, all the things that we have in our heads. Um, so, well, welcome everyone again. Um, this session is about how can we harness art, design, culture, and creativity in activism. And we are very excited to have you with, to have us, to have you with us today. Um, and we would like to open the space and frame a little bit uh, this second online session of what we call the Open Learning Series uh, that we are planning over the year, and we will continue launching uh, for the following months. The idea behind these sessions is to create a space to connect the web of people showing new forms of leadership with nature. We need spaces for people to come together and to connect dots. And it feels important to open it uh, for everyone who feels that this is needed. Um, to continue framing, uh, and as you may know, these sessions are part of the Bioleadership Project. Caroline was already introducing that a little bit. Now, our mission at the Bioleadership Project is to change the story of leadership by working with nature. And we are a movement of people and organizations changing human systems to be more resilient, regenerative, and designed to protect and regenerate our planet. Um, each of us work in different fields, projects, trying to lead the change that is needed. And we support each other as an ecosystem. Um, we do this through different circles. Uh, one is the consultancy, Another circle is the Bioleadership Fellowship, um, which is an, a nine month online program uh, with a huge community. We have today a lot of fellows. Caroline is a fellow also from the fellowship uh, from the first cohort. And we then have also the Innovation Lab, which are projects that are emerging from the community. Um, we always say that change can't be brought by someone alone. Uh, so we come together to share knowledge, stories, and the courage to grow a new generation of human systems that care for our world. Um, so this is here, it's another space that we have created for this um, to share that knowledge and learn together. So welcome to our second online series. Um, and I think for to start, it would be great. And Ella, if you can help me with, with the breakout rooms um, to open for three minutes, uh, one to one breakout rooms and, and just share with, with the other person what brought you here. Um, there might be people listening in the session and they cannot talk, so don't worry if that's the case. And if you join a breakout room that there is no one talking or with the, without the camera, then just take those two minutes for you and to breathe and to go for a cup of water or tea. Um, Ella, are we, are we ready with the breakout rooms? There, have you? I'm going to click open. Awesome. Enjoy, folks. Three minutes, folks. What brought you here? Why are you here today? Thank you. Five seconds and everyone is back. There it goes. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, great to have you back. I hope that was uh, good uh, to meet some of the other people. I'm sure it was very, very good. Um, please, Caroline, I'm going to hand it to you. Um, and let's start the session and let's introduce him. What are we doing today here and why are we here? Thank you. 
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Javi. Um, so yeah, I'm Caroline and I'm actually based in Somerset. Um, after living in London for nearly 20 years, I'm I'm now um in in rural Somerset, which is lovely. Um, I'm just gonna share some slides if that's okay. Um, because so much of that this is about um visual culture. Um, so I wanted to talk through images if that's okay today. So I'm just gonna um hopefully share some screen just bear with me can you see that yes we yes can see. thank you and then if i go like that oh no hang on no i don't want to do that oh sorry this is where my i want it i want it to be full screen don't i sorry if i go like that is that better Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'm Caroline. I, I'm the co-founder of Franklin Till. We've been running for 15 or so years. And um, I guess we're, we're designers um, and strategists and makers and thinkers, and we are climate optimists. And we're particularly really passionate about the role of art design and culture in addressing climate emergency and moreover I guess showing us that there is another way of being and another way of seeing and we're particularly passionate about the role of um, you know visual culture and um, and design and, and making things tangible to actually sort of lead us towards this this other world vision if you like um, and yeah, we, a lot of our work is about how do we engage audiences? I'm not going to sh show you our work today. I'm, I'm actually going to show you some other people's work. Um, and so I, I think Javi came to me and said, oh, you know, we want to run a session about activism. And I said, well, actually, we've been working with some incredible youth activists. One of our most recent projects was um, over the last three years, we've had the privilege of working with the Barbican, um, an arts centre based here in the UK. And um, they wanted to put on an exhibition exploring climate emergency. And we um, were invited to be the guest curators. And we started this project by having a, a kind of group um, of expert workshops. And we were engaging, you know, activists, um, uh, climate scientists, designers, artists, um, all sorts of different kind of um, disciplines and perspectives. And um, I just remember on that first workshop, we were engaging with um, key players within Extinction Rebellion, the, the, the activist group that probably many of you have heard of. And I remember um, them saying, OK, the thing that we always start with is we call it the apocalyptic recap that we um, we like to kind of give this really scary overview of where we are in terms of climate emergency. And I remember just thinking oh, that just feels so wrong and feels so problematic um so my background for seven years i ran a master's course at central st martin's which is where kate and abby who are going to speak after me are based and i remember you know our course was really centered around how we can use design to um and, and particularly material innovation to lead us towards a more sustainable future and i remember we were educating, you know, often mature students that were coming back from industry and wanting to redirect their career or, you know, embed greater purpose in their own practices. I remember the biggest problem we had was paralysis, was that the more these students knew, the less they knew how to actually engage with these huge issues, because the more kind of uh, I guess, knowledge they acquired, the more um, global perspective they had on these massive topics, the less they knew how to navigate. And um, and I suppose um, I wanted to sort of explore, you know, what how creativity and different creative approaches and particularly sort of really inclusive creative approaches can help to um, shift us beyond that sense of paralysis and, and find our own kind of voice and our collective voices. Um, and I guess for me, creativity and activism is completely, you know, interconnected. And I think we see that in, so for example, we in, in the UK had a really huge and exciting um, march called the big one, which was last month. And I think just the the, the way it, it enabled a sense of self-expression and, um, you know, just through the costumes, through the signs, and um, a lot of it was humorous, which is something I'll um, want to touch on again a bit later. But 
I think, um, you know, just finding ways to um, combine self-expression, making engagement with the hands. That's what I learned through um, running this master's course was that actually navigating through making and actually not necessarily even having um, you know, clear, full intention, but just allowing the the hand and manipulation of material, or or you know, whether it's drawing or whatever art form it is, um, really helped. And I guess the other thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, activism. I think can and and has been um, particularly, I'd say, in the UK, quite a, a rarefied topic. It was quite interesting, you know, when you think of activists, current activist people often talk about people like George Monbiot um, and, you know, that are doing incredible things. But there are so many, particularly this emerging generation that have a completely different perspective on what is activism and, and what form does it take and particularly the aesthetics of that. Um, and there's so, for example, this is Adapt. Um, they're a graphic design agency. I think they've they've actually um, their work has inspired us um, for for a few years now. Um, I think they've shifted onto a new project. But just the the graphic language, the way that they they you know engaged audiences, particularly younger audience, just feels so um, bold and accessible. Um, and creating things like. Um, uh, a series of scarves with with various different collaborators to um i guess empower people to have difficult conversations um, i'm just trying to move on and i don't know why my slides aren't moving on there we go or um chicks for climate a lot of the people i mention are really prolific on social media um and a lot of people i'm going to mention are, are are kind of youth activists or emerging activists Chicks for Climate um, is run by a trio that I had the pleasure of meeting through the Barbican. Nerj is just an in incredible young woman who has just forged this platform that's particularly active on social media, as I said, um, which is exploring um, the relationship between um, issues like the patriarchy and climate emergency. But again, that ha she has this really, um, and the team have this really kind of bold um, graphic language. You can see in a lot of the examples I'm talking about, colour plays a big role. Um, and um, and I think it's just really interesting, this this kind of reshaping of, of you know, actually, what what does activism activism look and feel like? Um, so again, incredible platforms like Climate in Color, um, exploring um, the relationship between um, you know issues of colonialism and and climate emergency. And again, a lot of this work is is showing up initially on social media and starting conversations and and having you know really difficult conversations. Um, people like Michaela Loach, um, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, she's just published her first book called It's Not That Radical, um, Climate Action to Transform Our World. Um, but, you know, uh, again, a very uh, young woman who has um, held, you know, uh, fossil fuel CEOs to account on, on, you know, large global stages and come out and said things like we shouldn't have billionaires at a Bill Gates Foundation event. Um, um, and yeah, just just some other people that have been inspiring us. The Earth Issue is um, a creative collective that we've done quite a lot of work with. Um, and they call themselves like a climate council. They're a global organization that just come together on, on different projects. And they're very pluralistic in their approach. Um, they don't have specific disciplines. They're not like, oh, I'm a photographer or I'm a, an artist or I'm a filmmaker. They 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 kind of shift and, and, and change roles depending on the project or, or the conversation that they're trying to raise. Um, and whether that be holding a fashion brand to account about their um, ethical or environmental issues. Um, we commissioned them to create a series of films um, called Stories of Change, which they use this incredible um, global kind of mycelium network that they have to frame 10 stories of climate activists um, that were at the front line of dealing with, um, you know, the, the, the very real impact of climate emergency in their localised communities. Um, and I just find that really inspiring that there is this this emerging generation that are so globally connected and um, particularly through obviously technology um, and are really sort of disrupting, particularly, I guess I'm talking a lot about the visual language um, and how that 
permeates our general uh, sort of collective culture. Um, so this is the work of um, Days Agassi, sorry if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly, from Earthrise Studio. And Earthrise Studio, again, another creative collective that are really wanting to engage audiences in issues around climate emergency. But um, their aesthetic is a lot softer. Um, you know, it's not as perhaps uh, as bold and shouty as, as, as some of the examples that I've mentioned, but, you know, really sophisticated. And then just a couple of examples to end with uh, before I hand over to Climate Emergency Network of, of, of humour, as I mentioned. And it feels like this combination of, of creativity and, um, you know, really kind of pushing the conversations in different ways, but combining that with something relatable. And um, so this is, so I'm just going to show this video. You want the dirt, I give you the dirt. I am the dirt that you live on the earth. You want it dirty, I give you the word. I give you the world. I make it work. I make it work. Work, work. I got the words working under my skirt. I'm what you live on. I'm what it's worth. I am the earth. I give you the dirt. Get on the ground. My body's so porous. My body's so round. Want to talk dirty? I'll give you the sound. Give me the roots. I'll give you the mound. Feed me your feces. We need to hustle. Clean up my beaches. Show me your muscle. I'll give you crabs. I'll give you turtles. Fill me up, baby. I'm filled and I'm fertile. You want the dirt? Feel in the clay and the sand up my shirt? I'm a fill. I'll give you a squirt. You want to eat it? You need my dirt. Potassium, nitrogen, enzymes, vitamins. Spread your seeds. I am vitamin. Giving you. Uh, you get the picture. So it's Hillier the Earth a New York based uh, sort of climate activist, but uh, you know, just that combination of creativity and humor just it feels so powerful. It's, it's, it's seductive, it's engaging, it's, it's inclusive um, and kind of goes beyond that feeling of, of being overwhelmed to actually like, you know, there's an energy and, and, and an invigoration. Um, and yeah, just one other example that's similar to that. This is Fandango, um, a designer, again, London based designer, um, and she's done some really lovely projects. She had um, an ice cream van that was dealing with global climate anxiety that she would um, drive around the country and park up and you could buy an ice cream and engage in conversation. And then this little image here is her most recent project, which is about to launch, which is a little discotheca. So um, it's about sort of alleviating climate emergency and, um, and anxiety through um, just having a little solo dance in this booth, this mobile booth, which is going to move around. So yeah, hopefully that just gives some sort of context and some some of the inspiring people that you know that we're looking at. And I guess when we came across, um, obviously I feel deeply connected to Central St Martins, but you know haven't sort of been uh, only working as a visit visiting lecturer now very uh, sporadically. And I was just so happy, you know, in the years that I was at St Martins sustainability was you know just a peripheral conversation and it it was it was not being dealt with in all courses that you know there wasn't really a kind of central uh, body that students could engage with to um so when I saw the work of um, climate, the Climate Emergency Network and saw what Kate and Abby were doing, it was just such an amazing uh, relief that there was, you know, they're working with these students that are the, you know, the, the next generation um, and kind of bringing together all of their incredible creative juices. And I think the first conversation I had with, um, I'll stop sharing now, the, the first conversation I had with uh, Abby and um, Kate they use these words defiant joy, um, uh, you know, saying to describe what they do. And I just thought, my God, yes, that's it. Um, and basically just wanted to bring them to the bioleadership community and just allow them to talk a bit about what they're doing and how they're approaching creativity and activism with this just kind of joyful, energetic um, vigor. So sorry, I'm going to, uh, if I've been a bit uh, over time, but now I'm going to just throw open and over to Kate and Abby, if that's okay. Thanks so much. Uh, that's such a lovely introduction. We really appreciate it. Um, hello, I'm Kate, uh, and Abby is on the move. But we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll go into that in a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen, and then hopefully you guys can all see what's happening. Um, let's see uh, this guy. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Is that working? Yeah, vaguely. I've just got to sort it out yes. now. It's working. Uh, yeah, you should be able to see a wild boar lurking. Um, okay. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. 
uh, Javi uh, and also Caroline and the whole Bar Leadership crew and the Franklin Till crew, thank you. We really appreciate being here. It's a real honor and fellowship sounds incredible. So uh, maybe one day uh, I'll apply. Um, sorry, just a second, slideshow, play from start. Um, so yeah, um, we are, um, Abby and I are uh, speaking to you on behalf of the University of the Arts London Climate Emergency Network. And funnily enough, I'm speaking to you from rural Somerset as well. Uh, so like like uh, like uh, Caroline, here I am in, in Somerset where I've just come from London. So Abby is currently in a station in London, uh, London Euston, dealing with some lots of hectic train delays. So Abby is on the move, but she's with us and she'll be responding as soon as she can in the chat. Uh, and she'll obviously interject if, if she can, but we're dealing with strikes tomorrow in the UK and uh, it's all gone a bit a bit topsy-turvy. Um, so um, Climate Emergency Network, um, we've been around since around 2019, um, or more like 2020 actually, so 2019, um, I guess there was this kind of real upsurge of interest and awareness and focus from our students, but also our whole community around climate emergency, um, XR, Fridays for Future, everyone was starting to really become kind of um, uh, unignorable. And, uh, you know, that's obviously something that at a university that's going to make itself known as well. And so we um, we started to organize with some help actually from a tutor, one of our tutors, who's one of the co-founders of XR, Claire Farrell. Um, we started to organize some assemblies, climate emergency assemblies, because they were proposed as a really good way to bring together everyone with an equal voice, um, you know, sort of introducing this idea of like the non-hierarchical distributed network, the idea of um, not having to be an expert, but just having to have concern and interest and passion for something, learning from each other, learning from invited guests, um, telling the truth. Um, and so it was a very, a very powerful set of assemblies that we held. And as a result of those, um, the university committed to taking certain kinds of action. Uh, some of them were about our operations as a university, our emissions, our energy use, um, management of waste, et cetera. Some of them were about what we taught to some of the things that Caroline was referring to earlier around, you know, is there enough around sustainability uh, in the curriculum? What are the students learning? What are they being assessed on? Are the staff equipped to actually convey this information? Do they, feel, you know, they they studied decades ago, some of them, do they feel equipped to actually inform and empower students in a way that's going to serve them in their future, which is as yet pretty unknown? So lots of different aspects. And one of the aspects was this need to form a community to continue mobilizing, supporting students. Um, and we all know that sort of forms of eco-anxiety and all the kind of psychological aspects, especially in young people um, around climate and ecological crisis is, is really intense. And so that was the aspect that um, I think we felt, I felt and colleagues felt was it was an important thing to try to address. And then COVID and suddenly the, you know, the kind of public global health started to dominate, obviously everyone's concerns. And we were, we were trying to make sure that planetary health um, stayed on the table. And so we basically went from having assemblies to creating a newsletter and then things started to snowball. Uh, we wanted to make sure people stayed connected um, through this network. You know, we're aware of the latest research, we're aware of the latest projects, could come together, share ideas uh, and so on. And, and so we really went from just a little newsletter in, in early 2020 to starting to create um, talks and events, um, sharing people's work um, and had a, a kind of big online uh, five day conference um, called Five Days, 10 Years, One Planet. That was in uh, the sort of September of 2020. Um, and Around the same time, University of the Arts London committed to certain climate um, actions in a climate action plan. Um, and they were along the lines of what I was saying before. So things around operations, around the curriculum, around working together and around our research and knowledge exchange. Um, and so the Climate Emergency Network went from this kind of um, internal lobbying bunch of students and staff fueled by a kind of anger and resistance to being something which was actually um, more integrated into the institution. And that's been an interesting thing for us to navigate, going from a sort of internal pressure group, uh, putting pressure on the university to do more and do, do more quickly, um, to then being almost kind of like um, uh, 
sort of commissioned or, or kind of act activism that's been kind of um, heralded by the university is kind of exemplary. Uh, and I, don't, I, you know, some of you may also work in large organizations or kind of understand these sorts of tensions. And one of the things when I presented in the past is this idea of like learning to do that dance from like pressure to kind of going from the margins to the middle and what that means and how the energy changes and how you're acting that's something that I think we're in the process of understanding at the moment it's like how to leverage that new position but it requires a different kind of energy um usually we show a film but I think what we'd love to do is not spend time doing that and I know that it's been shared with you in advance by Javi um if you do get a chance to watch our film um please do because it tells you a lot about who we are and what we do but instead, um, what we've decided to do is to share some of the things that we've learned that we hope will maybe be of use to you guys. And it'd be really nice to afterwards in a conversation, you know, get from you what, what you have to share. Um, because part of our network is obviously this idea of, um, you know, not all of us, we don't all, we, none of us has all the answers. Uh, and we're, this is all a new kind of existential moment. And we're all learning from each other, bringing different skills. But... What we've learned is um, in the same way that the this kind of idea of like the apocalypse summary, I can't remember what, what the word was from Caroline, the XR apocalypse bit, um, that feeling can be really alienating and disempowering and par paralyzing. And one of the things that, you know, the reason that the community is so important is it helps you to feel that you're not alone with all this. Um, and we do need each other. We're interdependent. And if we look at nature, we know that that is true. Uh, we are an ecosystem and uh, yeah the you know the the bugs the bugs need the birds the birds need you know we all need each other and that is a good and right thing um, and so for us community is really key and we're lucky in the work that we do because we have this ready-made community in the university um, and then we can reach out beyond um, that's us trotting along um, and this idea of finding your people, finding people who care about the same things as you is a really important starting point. And then I think the, the other thing that we've we've kind of realized and acknowledged is like, once you've done that, or once you've started to do that, look to look around you and think, is everyone represented here? Who's missing? Do we all look the same? Do we all think the same? Do we all sound the same? Uh, and to widen that circle, um, you know, it's, normal and understandable to be drawn to people who feel like they're your kin but I think there's there's this part where it's it's an important important thing to widen that and just to be conscious of that um I think we try to be conscious of that and I think it start it shows uh in the work that we do um resilience was mentioned earlier I think by Javi um yeah we, <sighs> caring Caring a lot can also mean arguing a lot, having strong opinions, and sometimes that can be exhausting. And trying to remember that caring and to be careful um, is a really key thing, like looking after each other. And so finding ways to make space for different opinions um, and energies, because we need all of them, but in a way that is going to keep moving you forward and not like destroy you from the inside <laughs> and that's something that's not easy and sometimes uh you need to step away um someone else needs to needs to take the the lead if you like for a while or a new idea needs to appear and, and maybe an idea another idea needs to fall away um i guess this is connected to the other points but taking a minute as well when you're doing this work uh if you have privilege of any kind, and there are lots of different forms of privilege, um, use it. Um, you know, for me, as someone who is a white female, middle class, well educated, brought up in a in a country where life is pretty pretty easy, comparatively speaking, it's uh, sometimes I feel guilty about that. But that's a completely useless feeling. Um, I need to use that, um, and so I try to, uh, and I want to do that more. But I think it's easy for us to either look at privilege and say that person is privileged and for that to be um, uh, a source of shame when actually that can be a source of empowering other people, bringing other people into, um, into the centre, being a bit quiet and um, yeah, use your privilege.
I don't need to say much more about that. Um, for us as a university, uh, we have a particular USP, which is creativity, uh, all forms of art and design and performance. Um, and in terms of climate action, we found that to be really, really key, because as we all know, creativity inspires, stories move people. Uh, we don't all respond to just facts and figures. Um, we need creativity is a huge part of how we can imagine an alternative future. Um, and oops, excuse me, your your USP or your superpower may be that too, as because you know your I have a creature here, sorry. Your 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 particular kind of gift or skill that you want to bring to this may also be creativity, maybe something else. You know. And maybe take a moment to think, you know, what is your unique contribution? Because we cannot all do everything or solve everything. You may have one simple thing. And it could be not creativity, it could be organization, it could be being an amazing host. Hospitality is a really important thing in terms of welcoming people into any kind of movement. Um, you might be great at facts and figures, you might be a baker. So maybe take a moment to think about, you know, what is your, what is your gift and your skill that is uniquely yours or quite specially yours that you want to bring to this? And I, I touched on this earlier, but um, one of the things I think the sort of learning from nature and this work starts to teach us is that none of us are a sort of unique single hero. That take, this is collective work. It takes all of us. And we have most of us who aren't super, super young have been raised on quite a kind of individualistic, heroic, almost kind of mythic cult of, you know, the artist with the great ideas and that kind of doesn't work um, with this stuff. And so to imagine what kind of heroism or leadership looks like, and um, I live in a place that's full of birds at the moment. And if you picture this migrating bird V, you know, they do take turns at the front of that V to withstand the strongest wind. And that is not, that's just a different form of leadership. And I think if you can look around you, um, yeah, see what kind of models of leadership feel inspiring to you and feel sustainable to you. Um, and maybe what kind of leader you are. Lots of people don't imagine themselves as leaders in this kind of area because they don't feel they know enough or they're not brave enough or, but actually leadership comes in many forms, just like activism comes in different forms. So consider what your kind of leadership qualities might be or what the leadership qualities um, around you might be and, you know, support other people to, to kind of, grow into those skills because we need we need more leadership um that is uh moved and powered by a different kind of energy um reimagine activism yeah your activism might be making tea for the people on the front lines or it could be having incredible graphic communication skills could be an amazing skill with color could be you speak other languages you know you yeah, activism is basically a way of living, a way of thinking, and being a, an engaged citizen, hopefully a creatively engaged citizen. Um, it isn't necessarily all just shouting angrily. Um, and likewise, you may find it hard to imagine that you have a lot of power, um, but power can be very slow. It can be gentle. Um, there's a beautiful poem by Sylvia Plath about mushrooms and this kind of quiet creeping at night gradually taking over, really unassuming, um, and to be patient as well. Um, so, you know, I think in a culture where there's a lot of abuses of power, think about other forms of power. And again, like you may take inspiration from nature. Um, this is obviously where water has eroded a, sto um, a cliff face. Um, you may have your own examples of like different kinds of power that might inspire you and kind of charge you. Dig deep, uh, like this, like this wild boar. Um, I guess the, the point of this one is just to say like, this is this is quite deep work because when you start it, you kind of, it can it can kind of take, take hold of you and you do need inner resources, I think. And so, you know, look around you, find other people who can support you. Um, it's gonna take a lot of your personal resources to 
yeah to to kind of commit to to this kind of work um but you will also find resources you didn't know that you had um and yeah learn from compost because you know even even shit can be compost for something so um think about what's no longer working for you it could be a way of working it could be um a line of argument it could be how you're eating uh, it could be um, a dynamic it could be anything but I would say um this idea of composting what's old and nurturing something new letting things fall away for new things to arrive is a really helpful one it's quite easy to get stuck on something um that sort of feels like it worked a while ago and doesn't work anymore um maybe try and let go of that I think that's quite helpful for us too with like with working with students we kind of love what's happening and then suddenly our students leave and new ones arrive and we have to reinvent what's happening and they have new ideas and they have a different energy and that's actually really healthy for us because it keeps us evolving and responsive to what feels most urgent and alive um and I think that's it those are today's reflections um so yeah it'd be lovely to hear any responses to that and um any questions but I'll hand it back to Caroline Amazing. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, I was going to kick off. We do questions now. Is that right, Javi? Sorry, I've lost. Yes, mine. we can. We can. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kate. First of all, and Amy, I know you are also there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, well, full of, of thoughts. Uh, and I would like to start this conversation and and maybe continue, you know, uh, and, and of course, we can later also allow all the all you guys uh, throw in the chat and, and if you want to do so, you can start doing also and we can give them voice. Um, but from from hearing to you, uh, Kate, well, first of all, it looks amazing. Uh, the movement, uh, it's incredible what you guys are are doing. And, um, and I can hear also from what you were sharing that when you dig deep, uh, it's it's also tough, no, and it's it's gonna be hard. So I want to ask, and I want to bring, um, and and Caroline said it before also. What's the role of joy and playfulness, and how are you bringing it, no? Uh, because it feels very needed uh, in all of this work. It sometimes feels like this is a big, huge mountain that we cannot climb, even when we are together, no. So how can we really enjoy this this work? And 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 yeah, and bring some playfulness and and joy. Uh, I would love to hear about your perspective and how are you guys doing it. Um, yeah, I appreciate we didn't uh, we haven't really shown a lot of examples because our work is really um, the work is. I, I hope you'll watch our film, um, and you know I haven't really talked about some of the big projects we've done. Um, so, I would say, creativity brings the the joy. So I think kind of this idea that um draw like um ideas ideas being generated feel like a kind of like self perpetu you know self perpetuating flow and when you know that you've landed on a great idea that brings you sort of sort of some happiness and i think i think our our students help us to do that when we're kind of running out of steam there's a sort of interesting i don't know how many of you work with with young people or in universities or schools um they always have better ideas than us, you know, they always know, kind of know more or differently to us. And so we're just there to kind of steward things. And I think we're just there to kind of bring out their ideas and try to empower them to feel like, oh, I actually do have some agency here. Um, I think the joy, yeah, the joy comes from that. It is defined in the sense that we know we could just all become paralyzed and we're choosing not to, because we kind of owe it to them because, <laughs> as part of an older generation, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm older than Abby, but I feel like I can't do that. I need to do my best to, yeah, at least uh, try to support and uh, make, make things possible as much as I can for, like, for our students. So that feels like a source of, of energy and joy. Um, it isn't a kind of, yeah, it's a it's a choice, I would say. I mean, I imagine other people can relate to that feeling. Um, it'd be nice to hear from them. Um rather than, yeah, uh 
it would be good to hear from other people. So I loved, for example, the thing that really um, captured our imagination is that you ran the Carnival of Crisis. Like how, because having worked at Central St. Martins, for those of you that don't know the University of Arts London, it's made up of a, a variety of different colleges, um, uh, London College of Fashion. Uh, anyway, some, some kind of world leading colleges, but they're, it, it's, it's a highly political environment it, because these different colleges are almost have different identities that they're trying to maintain while the overarching university body is trying to unify everything. And so there's all these tensions going on. And so I, you know, it was, I have to be honest and say it was the most <laughs> difficult environment I've worked within. And um, so I just know how amazing it is that you're able to sort of activate across the colleges, let alone across the, the student body. Um, I just, how do you do that? And and how did you come up with this idea of, because I just love Carnival of Crisis. This, yes, it, you know, we are in a crisis, but you're bringing this playful mm. approach to it. Um, I know you, you kind of answered that, but just specifically in that example, how did you get to that? And how do you activate across these political divides? Yeah, we, um, yeah, there's a few things to say about that. I guess um, we, do, we do quite a lot of listening, uh, which is why talking is sort of feels kind of like counterintuitive. But um, we do a lot of listening. Um, I think with, you know, yeah, lots of tuning into what's there, what's needed, uh, where the kind of, yeah, where the common ground is. Um, we try to address the kind of competitive urge of both the college, the, the kind of, you know, our colleges are quite competitive. They're very, you know, they're, they're quite powerful kind of cultural institutions and they compete against each other. And also, you know, a young, a young artist or designer has a very, you know, a kind of strong ego and there is competition there, um, you know, among students and we try to kind of do the other thing, which is the collaborative. Um, and that's also really strong. Um, we, with Carnival of Crisis, which was basically a two week kind of creative climate summit uh, that was our offering at the same time as COP26. I think we wanted to try and find that like connection between a kind of protest and a performance. And so we kind of like this idea of a parade, which seemed to sort of segue between, um, yeah, this, the notion of protest and the notion of kind of like, you know, uh, strutting your stuff on a catwalk or, you know, through the town. And also, you know, we're lucky that we work with um, very smart people. And that was actually like a little brainstorm with David Cross, one of our researchers, where this notion of carnival felt really right, because a carnival is something that has kind of embedded in it this idea of a kind of grief or like a kind of party at the end of the world. Um, so it is, uh, it is joyful, but there's a kind of, yeah, like a suspended there's something coming after carnival. Um, it's connected to like the kind of feast before the famine or um, yeah, this idea of like a, a, a sort of, yeah, like a defiance as well. Like we're gonna do this despite the fact that there is stuff around that is not as joyful as this. So it's just like carving out a space, I guess, and carving it out with a sort of exuberance and noise and flamboyance. And that felt kind of right at the time. Um, and it was also a way for us to quite cunningly convince the university, we're not protesting, we're parading. Um, so when it came to going through London and kind of asking lots of students who are some of them very young, some of them come from cultures or families or, you know, places where the idea of putting yourself at risk, if you like, especially if you look at the current conditions in the UK, protesting is not a joke. Uh, so asking people to parade through London uh, but in in a kind of creative guise, felt like a useful kind of Trojan horse for us as like a, a device. So I think there's a lot of that that goes on both within the university, but sort of in culture as well. Um, like Trojan horsing feels like a really key thing. Um, so yes, thank you for the question. Um, we would never have come up with the idea of Carnival of Crisis had we not been a bunch of people all working together. I would have never have come up with that idea on my own. Um, so that's like, it's a kind of case in point really. So, yeah, group work. Does anyone else have any? Uh, um, Javi, sorry, um, I've got. I'm terrible yeah, at following. Go for it. I was gonna share um, because we are going. We are running a little bit late, but yeah. it's great because the conversation is flowing. But we were gonna do some breakout rooms also to reflect yeah. between each other. But I think uh, because of time, maybe it's it's 
it's better if we just allow everyone here no, uh, to share if, if you have any reflection, if you have any question, and we can maintain the group as it is now, uh, and we can continue for another 10 minutes or something like this. Uh, and please, if you feel like you want to, to make a question or make a comment or reflection, please go ahead or put it in the chat. Um, and if you feel like that, just raise your hand and we can give you some voice. Or if you put it in the chat, I can I can also share and, and continue. Uh, so yes, please get involved in the conversation, everyone. While we wait for a question, I just oh. want to very just very briefly acknowledge Abby, who um, has been uh, working on this very intensely for the last couple of weeks, creating a gorgeous Earth Earth Day, Earth Week program for us, and is now kind of on a quite important moment of rest. So she's here with us, but you know, uh, also uh, slightly in the background. Um, but that's how these kinds of things happen. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Sorry. Yes, no, no, that's you. great. Um, Lucy, have Lucy, got a question from Lucy. You got a hand up. Hi, um, absolutely love it. This sounds brilliant. Um, I've got many questions, but the main one I want to ask is, uh, what differences have you noticed in who does and doesn't engage through the creative means that you are using? Hmm. Yes such a good question um lots of things happening in my head um i've got one quick answer to that as well which j just from our experience of our time on earth is kids are the yes are the do engage like i think that's the one thing that i always i have two young kids and i feel so lucky to be able to see from their perspective and just the openness you know because i think a lot of this is for me i think how can we be more playful? How can we, and that, that's an awful word in a way because it gets sort of taken up by innovation or branding approaches. And it's like, what is play, you know, how do we inject play? And, and that becomes a bit superficial, but I just think ki kids, I don't know if you'd agree with that, Kate, but, um, and I think that's something we don't design enough for is kind of multi-generational experiences. We often are like, oh, are we designing for kids or are we designing for adults? And it's like, well, why are we, why are we doing that? Um, um, so, yeah, the one group I would say that are constantly willing to get involved and, you know, without um, without preconception is kids. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. I um, I mean, we yeah, we we created something for our time on Earth at the Barbican that was all for families. And that was kind of with that in mind. Uh, it was called Earth Quest. And it was while our time on Earth, the show that um, Franklin Till created at Barbican. And it was a family drop-in and it was a kind of adventure. And the idea was, you know, some people are hesitant. They don't join in. And actually kids are kind of filterless and they just, they they get drawn to what feels appealing. Uh, and and they have, they kind of, the kind of lay, there are so many layers um, that you can reach through play and through this sense that um, there's not that much at stake. You don't have to be super smart or, you know, the one with all the answers or, yeah, and, you know, you won't lose face. I think that feels really important. Um, but at the same time, um, the, the, your question, um, Lucy, around who we reach, we, we often reach the usual suspects, which is, you know, which is fine. But we also have to go further than that. So we have a kind of like an amazing kind of core um, of um, really engaged folk, students, staff, people that we work with. And that's really beautiful. But we need to go further than that. So at the moment, we're trying to figure out, OK, how, how can we have the, the, the greatest impact? And sometimes it's about this kind of low threshold for participation. So it could be really simple thing really neat gorgeous idea that kind of takes someone in and then they can decide if they want to do you know to commit further to something I mean they call it like the commitment curve I think in like marketing and stuff and there is that aspect of like let's do something beautiful and simple that it will appeal to anyone and then we reel them in um, and then there's also levels of understanding so there's people who are really informed or really engaged who want to go a lot further and when you have when you're appealing to a wide community that has all kinds of different levels of experience confidence knowledge and so on it's sort of how you piece that together or you just decide this is for this particular constituency you know and for us at UAL we're trying to do a lot around like reaching policymakers, for example um, about the importance of creativity and storytelling and addressing major social issues um, how do we do that? 
what will policymakers be interested in? You know, what will make them roll their eyes? What will be just more noise? So I think uh, there's a lot that we're trying to understand about that as well. Um, because we don't want to just be speaking in like an echo chamber, obviously. And we also don't want to be just really pissing people off. Yes, so there's a lot to learn there. I think we're, it's a lot of trial and error for us, but we're really keen to learn from other people who are good at that. And um, we have a lot to learn from kind of other campaigning organizations. Um, and that's part of what my current job is, is working in this storytelling institute, a new institute at UAL, which is about bringing campaigning and creativity together uh, to create like this kind of hybrid change making set of skills. Um, so yeah, lots to learn there, but thanks for the question. I don't know if you have, um, if you have a view. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think you've given a very good answer, but I think it is, uh, I think the, the thing that I think is interesting is about how, how do you help adults loosen up, essentially? So it's interesting the way, I, I find it particularly interesting what you're saying about how you, you know, kids are always going to be foolproof leaders in this way, but actually it's the adults who are making the, it's the adults who will make the decisions in the years that count. Therefore, Yes, we need to engage kids, but that's a kind of medium to long term plan. Mm. So it's really to me, I'm completely focused on how do you get you know, how do you get people who are making decisions in the here and now to loosen up and be creative? Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating subject. Yeah. Um, there's some other questions in the chat that I'm just going to read out if that's OK, so we don't um, miss any. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, um, Chikara says, do you have any impact analysis tools to measure the effectiveness, effectiveness of art activism initiatives, inventions, interventions for social change? So do you have any impact analysis tools to measure effectiveness? Do you? Yeah, I, I just remember having to fill out those ref forms and talk about impact and, you know, what our course was doing and how. And it's so difficult, isn't it, Kate, to measure? I don't know. Uh, for me, yeah. I just remember when the... Um, uh, material future students used to go out to the world and garner press and then uh, you know and be in mag and, and they would, they'd sort of be at this peripheral point and then the ideas would trickle down into becoming more main you know and 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 then also I remember um, because it was one of the first courses that was interdisciplinary I had to fight every technician to allow our, our access to workshops because they were like well no if you know that you can only work in textiles or you can work in wood and I really had to to fight and 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 I had to well I found actually fighting didn't work so it had to be seducing with um chocolate and beer and stuff like that but um it just then it felt like once you'd broken that then you uh, I, I think probably now there's a culture of multidisciplinarity but sometimes like being the first is quite difficult isn't it I don't know do you have any tools um, do you measure yeah so um there's a lot in the, what you just said but I do agree that the relational aspect is really key and actually it speaks to what Lucy was saying before sorry was it Lucy yeah um around um how do you make this happen and it is there's a lot of and it, I wouldn't necessarily call it seducing but you know what I mean there's a lot of like massaging and it's yeah it's co it's complicated and that's a huge part of the work I think when you're trying to create a bit of like you're trying to change the culture of a place let's say from competitive to more like co cooperative um less single hero more like we're all in it together that takes a bit of change um I think the question around impact I mean that the, the, the simple answer is none of us are any good at it measuring impact speaking to people like Barbican like other like lots of other people uh we all do what we what we think we need. Like we all do surveys, feedback forms. We have some basic metrics, um, partly because we have to for funding and other things. But that's not good enough. And we're trying to work out how do we actually know that like change, like you leaving a, an exhibition and saying it was great, I'm really moved. How do we know that like next week that changes what you buy at the supermarket, or in a year's time you've actually changed your lifestyle, or you've decided to be more of a like active citizen, or whatever it might be. We're not very good at measuring that, but we are learning. And like I was saying before around campaigning, we're starting to learn from like social change um, analysis and stuff. And there is a, an interesting organization that we've been learning from called Doc Society, who are actually specialists in documentary filmmaking, but they do a lot of stuff called social impact production. And that's essentially what they do is they bake in this idea of what is a change you want to make? Who do you want to change? 
you know, what's the time scale and encouraging you to be really precise, which is connected to what I was saying before around you can't change everything for everyone. What is the thing that you're going to do? Um, and they've been helping us to sort of map out like, okay, here's the, imp here's the impact goal. Here's what's going to here's what it's going to take for us to do that and here's how we're going to measure whether it's happened we're kind of still learning how to do it um but the storytelling institute is is pl planning to do that too this idea that like you know lots of us who are creative we want to change the world we want to make it better we want to do great things you want to do good and we have a hunch about how to do that but we don't really know and press is one thing but that doesn't change people's hearts and the culture like it takes lots of different things to kind of coalesce to make you know, to make change um, and you can change people's minds, you can change people's behaviors, you can change infrastructures. Hopefully you can change policy and like the reality for people who never even encountered your thing. Um, we don't know. We should we need to we need to work together to kind of understand that better because um, we're kind of at the beginning of that, I think, and very open to other people's ideas and experiences in that uh, sense. Thank you. And um, we've got another question in the chat and um, maybe we've got time for just this one. Um, Day says, um, uh, thank you for the session. I work with the same approach and still get a lot of pushback from people and doomers. Do you, feel, do you have any research about how fear and doom impacts the brain and why creativity stroke play is a more powerful motivator? Hmm. I don't know if anybody can answer that, if anybody knows of any. I mean, I don't, I don't know any um, kind of formalised research, I guess, I'm thinking of um, one of the biggest challenges we face in our organization is um, working with huge fractured, massive global brands that there's a lot of ego within. So I think we, we do a lot of work with a major trainer brand that I'm always sure you will know. And they um, it's incredible how much ego there are in this company. And, and if we're coming up with um, a, a kind of alternative approach to material or manufacturing, we find that the way to get people on board is to actually run a session initially that is nothing about the project we're doing. So for example, we've done life drawing sessions within the organization, in their studios, doing something completely unexpected or unrelated. So we did a clay session um, and, and then we started to introduce the project while people were making. Um, just through talking, just through like, which is a bit naughty in a way. Sneaky. Because, yeah, it's sneaky. It's priming. But um, but but and then we started to sort of gently ask people's opinions about it. And 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 in a way, we were engaging them in a co-creation workshop, but they didn't really know about it. Because if we'd invited them to a co-creation workshop to engage in this project together, they wouldn't have shown up. Um, so, and, and I do, I, I don't have any research about it. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm really interested in, um, the relationship between hand work and brain work as, you know, thinking and doing and, and actually the fluidity between if you're in making flow, how that impacts your, how that opens your mind. And, um, so I don't know, that was just one, one thing that that question was making me think about. Um, it made that's so nice. It, that's so great. It made me think of um, there's a nice there's a there's an interesting organization called Moral Imaginations, um, which you, many of you probably have heard of. But Phoebe Tickell, who's the founder, she basically believes in imagination activism. So the idea that um, your imagination is a muscle and you need to use that muscle and we can't we can't imagine a better future like if we don't have the capacity and we've had we, our capacity to imagine the worst has been very well trained um and i think you know there's there is research around things like negativity bias and um you know we all we all have fear and uh you know we're all scared of how much it's going to take and the things we're going to lose and um yeah so she believes in in imagination activism and um i think that's something that you might want to look into um i find it quite inspiring not on its own but in kind of combination with other other things other approaches um just to kind of try to and and again there's some quite stealthy sneaky things that you can do to kind of get people's imagination muscles working um and you know even things like you know at the beginning of this session we had the lovely moment of meditation and this, you know the idea of like creative visualization and things like these things can really get you going um so yeah i would i would mention that um yeah 
Yes. Mm. Well, um, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, and everyone, everyone has been amazing in the chat. Uh, Kate, I will save if also the, the, the chat uh, just in case uh, we want to check it out. Uh, but there are many, many comments. But we need to be mindful of time, I think. Uh, I'm sure everyone has lots of things to do once we finish and we have three minutes left. So I, I think we can use these last three minutes to, to close the session and um, to say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you also, Kate and Abby. She has been very active also in the chat answering some questions. So she's been amazing. Um, and well, I think, I mean, there, is, there are so many things that have resonated through the session, of course. But I think one, the most or the biggest one that I strike with me was find your people, no? And I think that's exactly what we are trying to do with these sessions. That's what we are trying to do with the fellowship, with the Bioleadership Fellowship, no? which is this nine month program where, where we come together to, to learn together and to inquire together and to try to find solutions and, and help each other. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's, that's itself a success, no? that we are here and that's what we are doing and we are trying to broaden our network. Uh, I'm going to share in the chat um, the link also of the fellowship because we are about to open the applications uh, for next year. Uh, so that's also if someone wants to take a look and check it out. There are there have been so many fellows in the session also, uh, and that's also always great to see. And maybe just to close out, um, I don't know if, if you want to, Kate, to say something or Caroline before we close and, and before you say something, or after you say something, I can, I, I would love to close with a little poem from uh, Rebecca Solnit, but please go ahead, Caroline, also, if you want to say something. Um, I guess just um, how can we keep things joyful, not naively joyful, but find joy and for me it's uh, color and wearing color often people come up to me and go oh, I wish I had the confidence to wear or like oh did you get dressed in the dark I have quite a lot and things like that but um I I love that um so yeah just kind of finding finding your bit of joy that for me really keeps me going and Kate um just spending time in nature is really simple. Um, it puts things in perspective. It um, reminds me of what's true, um, um, what is working and what will continue to work even without us around, leaving it alone. Uh, so I would recommend even in your park or you know whatever, just watching a bird flapping around. I find it incredibly helpful. Um, when I'm stressed, which I am at the moment, it really helps me. Um, so, yeah, have a look at a pigeon and uh, yeah. Beautiful, totally, it grounds so much. Well, um, maybe to close, I would like to read this little sentence poem from Rebecca Solnit um, and then we can say bye. Hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch, feeling lucky. It is an ax you break down doors with an, within an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to, to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. To hope is to give yourself to the future and that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. So, well, Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Kate, again so much. So good to have you and so good to listen to all your experience. And goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.